Hello. Thanks for coming, everybody. We have, we're fortunate enough to have Jason Tate, who is the Education and Communications Director from the Office of Campaign and Political Finance. So he's going to tell you all what you need to know about campaign finance and your campaigns. All right, thank you. I was given this by the TV guy. So if anyone has any questions, just uh, feel free to, maybe I'll give it to Dottie here and she can pass it up. So in other words, yeah, feel free to ask questions as we go along. Um, you know, they'll pop up. There might be times when I say, you know what, we're going to cover that in like two or three slides. And so just for the flow of the thing, we'll, we'll delay it. But feel free to hit me with the questions. We'll probably be able to answer them right away. And if I can't answer them, which that happens, because there are all sorts of scenarios that, um, uh, that confuse us still, even though we've been in existence for 44 years, um, you can always email us. There are email addresses on that little trifold I passed out, that, that green one. And you can email us, and we're usually good at getting back to you within the day. Plus, that way, you have it in black and white. So, you know, if your opponent says uh, you can't do this, but then OCPF said you could, you can just show them the email and uh, make the problem go away. Uh, so thank you very much for coming. Uh, my name is Jason Tatum, the Communications Director at OCPF, which means I do the content of the website. Uh, I do, like, our newsletters, our YouTube, our Twitter, uh, those sorts of communications things. I'm also the media spokesman. So I always like to say, you never want to see your name and my name in the same news story, because it's probably never good. Um, it's probably because someone filed a complaint and then uh, sent an email to the newspaper, and now we have to go back and forth. Um, OCPF is a very small agency. They don't let us go into the state house. That's not actually where we work. We work in that ugly building right up there to the right called One Ashburton Place. Kind of looks like, if you've ever been in the military, it looks like a military barracks, for real because I have been in many military barracks, and uh, it's ugly, but um, that's where we work. We're on the fourth floor. Um, we have 17 people working there. We have, the backbone of the place is the audit department. So on one side of the office, we have this audit department, and uh, these employees go through every campaign finance report that's filed with us. So we have about 2,000 committees filing with us. These are your state reps, your state senators, political action committees, county candidates like your sheriffs and things like that. Uh, statewide candidates, like the Dedham Republicans and the um, West, uh, Westwood uh, Democrats, all these local party committees, they're all raising and spending money out there and filing their reports with us. On the local level, still under our umbrella, though, are untold thousands of folks like school committee members, selectmen, uh, town moderators, that sort of thing. And they follow our rules, uh, but they file with the local uh, clerks, the local election officials, and they're in charge of administering it uh, on your level. But overall, it's under our umbrella. And so these auditors, they go through the campaign finance reports. Every report that's filed with us, it's about 30,000 per year. Someone puts their eyes on these things. Um, on the local level, we have a former city clerk. Her name's Carol Valcourt. And she roves around the state and pops into towns and takes a look at your campaign finance reports there. Um, so even on uh, the local level, we do have uh, an auditor who goes around and, and looks at your reports. Nothing bad's going to happen. If she comes into your town to look at your reports, she'll go through. She'll probably see some issues. I mean, we see issues on all the campaigns. I mean, even, you know, uh, Governor Baker, he has a team of professionals doing his reports. We still have questions about those. I mean, just things come up. She'll have questions. She'll send you a letter. You fix your reports, and we just keep sort of rolling on. Um, so that's our audit department. On the other side, we have the legal department. And they answer questions. So if you have any campaign finance questions, give us a call. Uh, you'll probably be directed to the legal department. And they also open and close cases. So you know, feel free to give them a call. If they call you, that's bad, because that means someone complained. And so uh, they're trying to resolve some sort of a case um, uh, where, where, where you're involved. Uh, then we have our IT department. They're the computer people. And they've created what we call Reporter 6. Anybody here have any experience with Reporter 6? I don't see any hands. OK. It's the online filing system that you can use, even on the local level. Um, to get access to Reporter 6, you simply have to send us an email with your information. By information, I mean uh, if you have a committee like a, uh, where you fill out one of those 101 organizational forms, you send that to us. We'll get you set up with an account. And that way, you don't have to use this, this green form. You just type the information into the computer. Uh, create the report, and then print it off. That way you can just sign it and hand it into the local clerk. Uh, so feel free to send that email to me. We have about 400 
local people like yourselves using Reporter 6 in that fashion. Um, and then um, we have our director, Mike Sullivan. He's been the director since 1994, and he's appointed in a very unique way. The head of the state Republican Party, the head of the state Democratic Party, a law school dean, and then the Secretary of State. They get together every six years, they appoint a director, and they say good luck because we don't report, Mike doesn't report to anybody. He just runs the campaign finance law. If they want to reappoint him after the six year term, they can. Uh, he's up for reappointment again this year. So this is his, he just finished his, he's finishing his fourth six year term. So he's been there for quite some time. Also, he's a former city clerk out of Newburyport. So not only does he understand local issues, but he's an advocate for helping uh, people on the local level. So please feel free to call us and we will help you as, uh, as you try and raise, spend money, and then file these reports. Some important ground rules. Um, you know, 99% of what the campaign finance law is, is disclosure. Money raised, money spent, let's show the public what it, what it looks like. But we, there, is a, there, is, there are a couple slivers in the campaign finance law that deal with these issues. Public employees, public buildings, and public resources. And these actually create, um, a significant number of cases, and you'll see why. And by cases, I mean you know like legal cases where our lawyers have to resolve them. Uh, for example, uh, public employees. Who's a public employee? Well, I'm a public employee. I'm a state official, but it's anyone who's employed by the state, county, or a municipality. So these are your community college workers, people who work, uh, teachers, firefighters, uh, police officers. Um, they're people who work at the senior center at UMass, substitute teachers. These are all public employees and they have to stay away from the money. 24 seven nationwide public employees like myself are prohibited from soliciting or receiving campaign contributions. Um, so what exactly uh, does that mean? Um, the receipt of campaign contributions. So it's solicit or receipt. What's a receipt? The receipt of campaign contributions um, is the actual physical taking, the, the, the actual taking of the money. We had a case once uh, on the South Shore, uh, so a person was running for city council, and as I hope most of you know, you need to get the name and address of every donor, from dollar one all the way up to, does anyone know the limit? The contribution limit? Thousand bucks. Um, so from dollar one up to a thousand, you need name and address. Uh, well, at this event, um, the line started getting really long because people were coming in, they were trying to get the names and addresses of these people. So the candidate went up to his wife and said, hey, can you please sit down and start to take some of these checks? We need to get these people inside, get this party started. No problem, she wants to help out. She sits down at the desk, take, starts taking checks, names and addresses. Someone sees her, and not everyone at this event was this candidate's friend, obviously, and they recognized her as the, the spouse of the candidate. She works part-time at the DPW two towns over, so they reported her. And our office found that it was a violation of Section 13, this public employees part of it. So you can see how easy it is. This person was just trying to help. Uh, you know, someone, you know, her husband asked her to sit down and take checks, no problem. Um, but uh, you know, that's the kind of thing that when you're having your fundraisers or you're at your events, or maybe you're a public employee, just to look out for. Among our cases that, uh, that um, involve public employees, most of them have to do with the solicitation of campaign contributions, the actual asking of money. So what, what forms can that take? Um, for example, you know, maybe you have your campaign and it's coming up, the election's this spring, and running up to the election, um, you're meeting with your family and friends, your, t your campaign team, every Wednesday night in your, in, in your kitchen. And one night in the kitchen, um, the candidate takes a look at the RSVP list for the upcoming fundraiser. It's going to be a fun, maybe 50 people coming, you're hoping, but only 25 people have RSVP'd. So the candidate says, hey, all you family, friends, volunteers, call the other 25, 30 people on this list uh, and ask them if they're actually coming to this party. Invite them, make sure they're coming. Um, well, cousin number three, who um, is a police officer in the next town over, He'd have to say, sorry, can't do it uh, tonight because I'm a public employee. I can't make those fundraising phone calls. That's the sort of thing um, that, that we're looking at. Another example, I mean, social media is sort of ground zero for this now. Uh, you can just imagine, maybe it's a Sunday afternoon and someone who works at uh, the local community college, um, let's say I work for the local community college, I sit down on my couch, I open my private laptop, and I call up my personal Facebook page and I say, hey, uh, my brother Steven's running for school committee. 
Our parents are having a fundraiser for them Friday night, 25 bucks a head, hope to see you all there. I post that to Facebook. Well, someone sees it and knows that I'm, I work for the community college, they'll copy and paste it, put it in an email and zip it off to OCPF. And our general counsel will look at it and say, yep, that's a violation. Um, they also CC it to the newspaper and that's how these stories go. But even on social media, um, public employees should not solicit or, or should not solicit campaign contributions. These questions aren't always easy. This law was written in the 1800s when they were developing light bulbs, let alone, you know, Twitter. Um, but our office has been working hard and sort of mirroring what the Federal Election Commission does. They're, like, they're, they're the federal OCPF or the state level, kind of what they're doing. And um, we've even, we hate this question, but we get this question. You know, my sister, um, I'm running for, uh, uh, for selectman and my sister, um, she's a school teacher. And I, put, I posted on my Facebook page that my fundraiser's coming up Wednesday night. She liked it. Now that shows up on her feed, we'd say that's, that's a problem. Um, so even like your friends, you know, say, just have them stay away from the fundraising part of it, even on social media. So that's the solicitation and the receipt of campaign contributions. By the way, this is about an hour. I, I, I usually open with that, and so everyone knows, uh, in case your stomachs are grumbling. But um, this takes about an hour, this whole, uh, this whole thing. So um, what can public employees do? I mean, many of you are probably sitting there thinking, I know a lot of firefighters, police officers, and school teachers involved in campaigns, and they are very involved in campaigns. They can hold signs on their own time. They can, they can go on Facebook. They can go on Twitter and say, my good friend uh, John is running for selectman. Uh, please vote for him at the upcoming election and post that to Twitter or to Facebook. That's okay. There's no money involved. Um, they can donate to your campaigns up to $1,000 just like anyone else. Um, so you can have a... If you have a fundraiser at, a, at the local function hall, let's say it's the VFW, and you know, half of the people who show up are public employees, that's okay. They can, they can donate, they can show up at fundraisers. That's not a problem at all. So any questions at all about public employees and what they can and can't do? I'll, I'll, I'll uh, mention two other things, actually. Um, elected officials are exempt. So, I don't know, Dottie, are the selectmen paid here in town? Do they get a stipend? Okay. So they might be considered public employees in some other statutes, but in our statute, an elected official is exempt. So that's why you know, a select man could solicit or receive here in town, uh, because uh, same as you know, Governor Baker, you know, he gets a paycheck, but he is able to solicit or receive. And then finally, um, public employees, when you form your political committee, if you do form a political committee, public employees cannot be the treasurer. So please try and avoid that. Public buildings, we've got a senior center up there. I see a city hall, a library, a couple city halls actually. Um, the rule is similar in public buildings to public employees. There's a ban on soliciting or receiving in buildings used for governmental purposes. I'm just gonna cheat real quick and look, okay. Um, so what does that mean? That means, you know, it, over here in town hall, you know, if a selectman is, you know, visiting town hall, she shouldn't walk around to all the different departments and say, uh, by the way, my fundraiser's Friday night. Uh, hope to see you there. You know, sort of that, like, almost feels like a little bit of pressure or, or maybe even just say, hey, uh, you know, can you, have, can you give me a campaign contribution? We don't see that. But that, it goes back to the day when that kind of stuff may have happened, especially in city halls with mayors marching around city hall or something like that. So how might this affect you? Well, how we see it most now on the local level is through either emails and invitations. So... Let's say it's time for you to send out an invitation uh, for your fundraiser. And um, uh, you're sending it all over town, but then you think, you know what? If the police chief and the fire chief show up, that would show a lot of support for my campaign. So cousin number two, who's helping me out tonight, can you send invitations to the police chief and the fire chief? Cousin number two is thinking fire department and police department. And that's where the invitations go, into this building and then into the fire department building to the chief we would say that's a solicitation in a government building. So please send all your invitations to residential addresses, businesses, that sort of thing, uh, not into government buildings. Where else might you trip up? Uh, your email list. A lot of campaigns now, even from small to large campaigns, they build up an, a, an email database so they can blast out information to supporters. Well, please scrub all your government email addresses from uh, that list so that your campaign materials aren't going to government email addresses. Our office has taken the view that that could also be construed as soliciting in a government building. So um, 
you know, I could go on with more things on government buildings, but those are the, the, the main points. Any questions at all about what can happen in a government building? Okay. Uh, sort of related, public resources. Public resources may not be used for political campaign purposes. So what does that mean? Like phones, email, vehicles, paper, labor, and employee time. You know, I'm a state employee. I have access to actually some pretty good copiers at my office. If my friend is running for a state rep, I don't want to make a thousand copies saying vote for Joey for state rep and then take it to the parade that he's in. I mean, it's pretty obvious stuff. Where do we see violations of this most often? Uh, overrides, debt exclusions, like when they want to build a new high school. I have you guys had to build, do that lately around here? A lot, a lot of times in towns, you have to build new high schools, new police departments. I don't know if an override was required for this, but um, you know, the, the school superintendent who wants that new high school, you know, she might sit down and write out something that says, uh, you know, please vote yes on the new high schools for the future of the children. Makes a thousand copies, gives it to the teachers, the teachers put it in the backpacks. We'd say that's a problem because public resources were used for campaign purposes. Um, on the candidate level, we don't see it so, uh, as much. What we do see on your, on your level, though, is uh, the very bottom language there where it says equal access. So what does that mean? That means that if uh, one candidate for school committee can go to the senior center with coffee and donuts and talk about the issues with the seniors, no fundraising because it's a government building, right? Uh, but talk about the issues, then all candidates can do that, can bring coffee and donuts to the senior center and ask for that. Um, one of the more uh, uh, popular um, questions that we get is, in a government building, can I ask for nomination signatures? Um, we say it's no problem. As long as everyone can do it, then as long as one person can do it, all everyone can do it. Um, so that's the equal access policy. We, uh, uh, during the presidential election, was that last year, the, the primary? I'm, I'm losing track of time here, but I think it was early last year when we had the Massachusetts um, presidential primary. And um, we, I got a call because Bernie Sanders was at UMass and he was giving a speech at the UMass gym and they said, That's, you can't use public resources for campaign purposes. We said, it's fine so long as Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton can have access as well to that UMass gymnasium under the same terms and conditions. So that's equal access, that's public resources, and we're done with the with the three ground rules. Any, any questions at all on that stuff? All right. Some of you may recognize this. This is the statement of organization. We call it the 101 form. This is the thing you'll fill out if you want to get reporter six access from me. So uh, you know, if you fill that out, scan it, and send it uh, to OCPF, we'll, we'll get you access to reporter six. But it's also what you fill out um, if you are, are forming a committee. Um, a committee can be made up a lot of times on the local level. The, the candidate is the chair, and then someone else is the treasurer. So it sometimes can be a two-person deal. You file that form, and then you can begin to raise and spend money. Some campaigns on the local level, let's say you're running for um, school committee, you figure it'll cost you 500 bucks maybe to buy a few lawn signs and some mailers. You're not even going to do any fundraising. You don't even have a committee. It's just, you know, you're just running by yourself. You don't have to file this. You can just spend your $500, report it. Um, but um, a committee is not required. But otherwise, you know, we highly recommend for all other situations that a committee is formed. And it's formed just by simply filling out this form and handing it into your clerk. Then your committee is formed. Where do you get a copy of that form? Um, on the OCPF website. I mean, since the question is asked, I'll just go there right now. Uh, this is the OCPF website, ocpf.us. Uh, you know, the best place to find it is just to go to the bottom left-hand corner where we have a clerk support button. And all the forms are listed right here. And there's the 101 right there. And then, you know, your other campaign finance reports or forms are right there. Um, and if you're going to self-fund your campaign, is there a dollar limit that you don't have to fill that out? Or it doesn't matter? To fill out the organizational form? Um, no, if, if you have a committee, so if it's you and at least one other person, uh, then you must fill it out. Oh yeah, it, then you must fill it out. If, um, but otherwise, um, if it's just you're, a, you're the lone wolf, you're just running by yourself and you're spending out of pocket, you don't have to fill this out. It's a good idea to fill it out though, because people expect it and if they don't see it, then they start making complaints and people you know, start writing stuff on Facebook. Um, so we recommend that everyone fills it out because you know, it's not hard to do. Um, when are these reports due? 
the big, re you know, the first report is going to be the pre-election report. It's due eight days before the election. And the report runs from January 1st until 18 days before the election. Um, so it's due eight days before, and the report runs from January 1st until 18 days before the election. And then also expected is the post-election report, which runs from um, 17 days before the election until 20 days after the election, and it's due 30 days after the election. I'm sure all of you understood exactly what I just said. Um, it, the good news is that it's uh, written down in the green pamphlets, and your town clerks will probably be able to, to give you those dates if you call up, or they may even give you um, a packet that has those dates in them. Um, but the key here is that everyone who's on the ballot here in 2018 must file both of those reports, the pre-election and the post-election. Everybody, even, even the zero people, the people who are like, didn't spend any money, everybody on the ballot files those two reports. And then if you win or if you still have a balance or liabilities, then you file a year-end report, and it's due January 20th each year. So uh, in, for 2018, to cover from January 1st until December 31st, three reports are filed, the pre-election, post-election, and then the year-end report. Any questions on reporting requirements? Yes. Casey, quick question. Um, if someone doesn't have a committee, if someone doesn't have a committee at all, doesn't start a committee, is running unopposed, is not raising any money, they still have to file a report um, prior and after if they're a candidate for election? Yes. Uh, yeah, everybody who appears on a ballot must file the reports. Yeah, this, this report here, not the 101, this report right here, the M102 form. Yep. So everyone who appears on a ballot must file the form. Okay. And they do it on our level too. We have, you know, we have like 400 uh, candidates for uh, state rep and state senate. There are there are a bunch of them that don't do any activity, but they're still required to file with us as well. I think there might have been a question over here. It's OCPF.us. That's it. Yeah. Mass or anything? Nope. Just OCPF.us. Thank you. So that this is being televised. So when you want to have a question, just raise your hand and I'll raise it. Okay. All right, what's next? Running for office. Um, what do you have to keep? The, the statute requires uh, that you keep all your paperwork, all your receipts, your invoices, uh, copies of whatever it is that your campaign generates for six years. Um, so, you know, I have the, the picture of the warehouse there just to, to show that you will need some space in the closet. Um, summary page. So this is the front page of a campaign finance report, like this one right here. Um, what are some of the parts that I want to point out? The, the dates on the top, uh, it's, they're hard to see there, but th that's the beginning and the ending date. Uh, so you'll get those from your clerk or, you know, you can figure it out yourself. It, the, report, uh, the reporting period ends 18 days before the election. Um, and then I want to show just the summary information. It, it is kind of hard to see, but uh, Right there, the $4,366 figure, that is the uh, ending balance. Oh boy. Uh, that's the ending balance. That should never be negative. So when it's time for you to hand in your report at town hall and you see a negative balance right there, something, something went wrong. It should never be negative. Um, so you can, you, know, you can try and figure it out or even call OCPF. Our auditors deal with negative balances all the time. And, and what probably happened was you spent money out of your own pocket using your, maybe your personal debit card and you just didn't quite report it correctly. Um, so, you know, please give us a call if you have any problems with a, ne with a negative balance. Okay. Yes? I just want to clarify something. So if there is a candidate who does not have, they're not taking in any money, they're not doing a committee, I thought it was the M1020 eight days before and 30 days after. That's an option. Yeah, that is an so option. What, what yeah, we but, usually... yeah. What we're saying in general is that a report is filed. Okay. Oh. Yeah. It, wh whether they sign the zero or they just sign this thing, we sort okay. of consider it the same okay. thing. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, so raising money. What, some of the big, uh, the big thresholds, $50. $50 is the cash threshold. So you can have a, you know, like a, a little backyard um, sort of fundraiser, and it's all, it's $25 a head, people can give you cash, that's fine. Um, you can take that, uh, still need the name and address, but um, you can take cash up to $50. The campaign finance law does not require you to disclose on this form 
your small cash contributions, uh, we, we recommend that you do. Um, but all contributions of more than $50, you must put the name and address into the form that, that you file with the clerk. Uh, contributions that are less than $50, you can put them together as a lump sum and report them as a lump sum on the report. Uh, $200, occupation and employer of the donor is required. So if someone gives you uh, maybe your brother-in-law and he's uh, maybe he's a doctor and he gives you a you know, $500 check, you would just put you know, doctor, uh, mass general. Uh, in the occupation and employer. So that threshold is $200 for occupation and employer. You can take money orders up to $100. Um, $1,000 limit, by the way, is um, uh, the limit from an individual uh, to, a, to a candidate's campaign for the calendar year. It's $1,000. You can take money from PACs. So there, we have 250 state PACs, and you know if you're friendly with some of them, you, they can give you up to $500 per year. And um, what about ch splitting checks? You know, sometimes you know, maybe a married couple will give you one check and it's for $500 and they like, but we want it to be from both of us, you know, 250 from one, 250 from the other. That's okay as long as both names are printed on the check. So you can split checks that way. You just put it in two separate lines um, on the report. And so I think all of you have a campaign finance report there. If you, go, if you go to Schedule A receipts, I just want to point it out real quick. I know it's obvious, but that's where you would put the information. The date, the name and address, the amount, and then occupation and employer. If, if one of you signs up for our Reporter 6 program, um, you would just type that information in. Jason? Yes. Another question that I had too was... Ooh, somebody had asked if a husband and wife, they can both go, go up to $1,000. Yes, so you can take $2,000 from a married couple, yep. <coughs> uh, so just a few things. Uh, in this case, the candidate decided just to lump sum all their cash contributions. So that first one you see there for 650, that's just all their cash contributions just put in a lump sum, but they do have the records um, of, of everyone who gave them money. Um, small contributions can be itemized. You see the one from John for $25. Uh, Rich Gotham, I don't think that any of you will come into this problem, but if someone gives you 200 or more and you don't know where they work or what their occupation is, um, it, the law does require you to send a letter, but I, I would bet that you would know everyone who gave you $200 or more. Um, and then you see, you know, Howie Long, $1,000, he's a truck driver, so occupation and employer because it's over 200 And uh, let's see, uh, loans. You can loan as much money as you want. Uh, a candidate can loan as much money as he or she wants to his or her own campaign. So feel free to loan as much as you want, but as you can see here, Joe Smith, the candidate, he loaned $1,000, so it's reported as, reported as a uh, receipt to the campaign. Any other questions about how money can be raised and, and, and brought in at all? Um, a popular uh, question that we get a lot is, uh, involves raffles. Um, raffles uh, are prohibited. Uh, this, the Attorney General has stated that, po that uh, political committees are not allowed to raise money by raffle. Uh, so just a, just a little tip there. Um, what about business contributions? You, you have a friend who runs a, a, um, a consulting business. They send you a check and it's on his consulting business check, and then you look at it and it says LLC there. Can you deposit it? No. Uh, business contributions are prohibited. LLCs, partnerships, corporations, um, LLPs, these are all prohibited contributions, so uh, please don't deposit those in your account. That includes in-kind contributions, and uh, our office actually does get quite a few of these complaints uh, each year. And you can imagine, let's say, um, your friend has an open storefront and they say, you know what, for the campaign, why don't you use the storefront and you can run the campaign out of that storefront. Um, because you're my buddy, you, you can have it for free. You know, you're only going to use it for three months. Um, we'd say that that's a prohibited business in-kind contribution because you're, your campaign's receiving something of value from an LLC or a, or a corporation or something like that. So uh, we say that candidates must pay for every, anything they receive from a business. Uh, it, it could include restaurants as well. You know, maybe um, your friend owns a restaurant and there's a function room. Normally it's $500 a night for a wedding or a birthday party, but for you it's free. We'd say, no, you do, you do need to pay that $500 um, for the use of that restaurant. Um, what are in-kind contributions, by the way? It's anything of value that's not money. So we have some plywood up there. 
you know, let's say that's your uncle's plywood and he's like, you know what, let's cut these things in half and then we'll plaster your lawn signs on them and we'll put them up on each side of the road, you know, where your cousins live and that way people, you know, will see them coming and going. Um, you know, you, you use 10, 10 sheets of plywood. How do you report that? Maybe you call up Home Depot and say, how much is a sheet of plywood? And then you'd report that. So an in-kind contribution is something of value that's not money. Or maybe a friend uh, at your fundraiser paid for the DJ. You know, you can, they can say, you know what, that's my in-kind contribution to your campaign, paying for the DJ. All right, and that'd be reported on Schedule C. Here on the campaign finance report, in-kind contribution, Schedule C. Um, what's not an in-kind contribution? Uh, let's say you want to put together a website for your campaign. So you call a website company and you say, um, uh, yeah, can you put that together for me? It'll cost you $600. Uh, or $500, and you say, ah, that's too expensive for my, for my, for my campaign. Um, but then you remember your, your nephew is really good at putting together websites. He said, I'll put it together in one night. Don't even worry about it. He does it. Did he just give you a $500 in-kind contribution? We say no. We say that um, it was just a personal service. He's just a volunteer, the same as someone who holds your sign. Your nephew just happens to be good at websites, so he created the website for you. No, it's all off the books, you don't have to report it. So personal services, you don't have to report. Um, Out-of-pocket expenditures. Uh, local campaigns do these all the time. And so this is how they're reported. Let's say you're running your campaign, you get the call, okay, your, um, your lawn signs are ready. You don't have any money in your campaign account, um, but you plan on putting your own 500 bucks in anyway, so you run down to the lawn sign company and you pay for the lawn signs using your personal debit card. And you're just gonna let that be a, contribution to the campaign. That's fine. How is it reported? A $500 contribution from yourself to the campaign on receipts on the receipt schedule. A $500 expenditure to the lawn sign company on schedule B. And then if you hope to get paid back someday, which we recommend you put this down, you put it on schedule D, liabilities, which is on the very back, schedule D of this campaign finance form. That way, you know, at some point, maybe you'll run for state rep, you never know. And then your, your, your campaign really starts to build up money, you can pay yourself back at some point in the future. Always makes the spouse happy um, when you get that extra bonus check, um, you know, 10 years after you initially invested in a campaign. So spending money, a candidate can make expenditures to enhance his or her political future. Uh, so mostly on the town level, I mean, if you're spending money, it's gonna be on your, your mailings, your lawn signs, you know, boosting Facebook posts. I've seen that a lot lately. Uh, just getting the word out. Um, and that's all great. That's all enhancing your political future. But, you know, we mentioned those Wednesday night campaign meetings. Um, what would happen if you used the campaign debit card and bought pizza for your volunteers that Wednesday night? Would we say that's okay? We do. We say that's okay because it's not primarily personal. You're doing that to enhance your political future by, you know, feeding your volunteers. And that's fine. Um, if it's personal, though, that would be prohibited. What's personal? We had a case once where um, uh, somebody, I believe it was a mayoral candidate, but, uh, uh, but I, I'm not quite sure or quite remember, but um, they, um, they reported these massive expenditures for landscaping. And so we questioned it. He said, why, why, why for all the landscaping? And he said, well, because, you know, I'm a candidate for mayor and uh, my house has to look good. You know, I have to keep up appearances. We said, no, that's primarily personal. You know, it might a little bit help you out, you know, keeping up appearances, but that's primarily personal. You can't use your campaign funds for that. Um, so if you think you're in a gray zone where you're like, you know what, I don't know if this is legal or not, just give us a call. We'll give you the thumbs up or the thumbs down on, on your idea for, for spending money. Uh, personal expenditures are prohibited. Um, please be as detailed as possible when you're describing the purpose of your expenditure. So if you're buying t-shirts, just don't put clothing. Because that, if, if, you know, if Carol comes by and looks at your report or you know, your, your reports, many of them go online. They're scanned and put on the town website. If people see that, that's gonna raise red flags. Um, you know, say 100 campaign t-shirts. That way, whoever's looking at them will pass right at these reports, will pass right by and say, oh, okay, that is for a campaign expenditure because you know, buying clothing is prohibited by the campaign finance law. So in your expenditures, be as detailed as possible. The pizza that you buy for your volunteers on Wednesday night, don't just put, or please just don't put, you know, dinner because that will raise red flags, say uh, pizza for Wednesday night, you know, for campaign volunteers, uh, stuffing envelopes or something like that. As much detail as possible is the best. Um, 
uh, this one is, is for when, if you do, it's very minor, but if you um, are, are using gas to drive around, let's say your cousin drives all over town, putting up your lawn sign, ended up putting like 60 miles on his car. You can reimburse him for that using the IRS rate. He's like, anyway, you can reimburse me for gas, just 60 miles times the IRS rate, and that's, uh, and that's how much you can reimburse that person. So it would just be an expenditure to your cousin uh, for gas to put up lawn signs. <clears throat> Um, to buy a suit? No, we'd say no. Um, uh, we get this question, especially a lot in towns because you know, sometimes people get voted as selectmen and they're like, you know what, I don't even have a nice suit but I need to wear a suit every, you know, every other Wednesday for, this, uh, for these selectmen meetings. Uh, and they, they ask, can we buy a suit? We say, no, clothing is prohibited um, because we feel that clothing is primarily personal. Um, so just some ex uh, examples of expenditures. Uh, 200 lawn signs, you know, as much detail as possible. Food for the fundraiser, candidate contribution. Uh, the out-of-pocket expenditures, that's what that would, that would be. Or no, a candidate contribution is um, you can, let's say you win your race. Now it's, you know, you're going into August, uh, September, and you want to support your state rep. You can cut a check for a, up to $100 to your state rep or state senator if you want to help support their campaign. You can cut it from your own campaign account. Uh, reimbursements. So if someone went out and bought $200 worth of pizza for um, your election night volunteers who are holding the signs, then you can reimburse them. It would just show up as a, uh, a check to your, to your cousin, or to, I mean to the person who bought the pizza, and then um, it would be detailed on this reimbursement form. It's called an R1. And all these forms are available at the town clerk's website. Liabilities. Uh, these, these are uh, debts owed by the campaign. Usually it's just the candidate's own money that is put into the campaign. Um, it could also be any bills that are unpaid. So you see here Draper Button Company, 500 campaign buttons. You've passed these buttons all over town, but Draper hasn't sent you the bill yet. You would just put it on Schedule D on your campaign finance report to show that uh, you, you know, you're going to pay it here in the future, but it, it just hasn't been paid yet. Uh, so, you know, we've talked a lot about the campaign finance law and it's, uh, you know, it's a little bit, uh, it's, a, it's a criminal statute. And at the end of each section, um, there's, there's talk about jail time and these massive fines. No one's going to jail though. So I just want to talk a little bit about how we resolve cases. I'm going to go to our website real quick. So this is the front page of our website, ocpf.us. And uh, I'm going to go here to legal. And I'm going to go to agency actions. Um, so a public resolution letter. This is our way of resolving cases with, and not having to go into court. It's a letter that says, okay, you, you know, you made a mistake. You, took a, you accidentally took a check from your friend who you thought was from your friend but was really an LLC. You've purged that money back or you've, done, you've taken some action you know, from the, uh, based on the guidance from our lawyers. Now we can move on. Those letters are all posted here under public resolution letters. You know, we only have, what, four this year so far. Um, 2017, you know, there are some, some letters there listed. So they're listed, but it's our way of saying, okay, this is resolved, and now we can just move forward, stay out of the courts. There's also a disposition agreement. That's if it's a little bit more serious. Lately, it's been all dark money. Anybody hear about dark money? Like in the news, people talk about this dark money, no? Um, Dark money is when a group or an individual tries to hide the, the, the source of the funds. Um, in the Boston Globe recently, they, they, they talked about a case that we resolved where, um, well, I'm, I'm, most of you probably remember this, voting on the charter school ballot question in the last election. Well, um, a group allowed individuals to give money to them, and then that group sent the money to the ballot question committee to hide the, the identity of the original donors. And so we closed the case and they, we closed it for like, uh, the payment was $426,000. So that was a big one, our biggest ever. But as you can see, you know, some of the dollar amounts are like 150, 185, things like that. This is for, these are for bigger cases. I don't anticipate we'd ever have one, you know, on the local level like this. But that's another way for us to resolve a case and stay out of the court. Uh, finally, there is a, um, uh, we can refer a case to the attorney general for possible criminal charges. Uh, just for example, uh, John Bonomo, the guy here at the bottom, <clears throat> he needed money personally, so he stole more than 100000 from his campaign, and um, when he was convicted, he went to jail for two and a half years. So this is not to scare you. This is to show that you know, we have um, more than 2,000 committees organized with us, untold thousands on the local level, 
And my boss, Mike Sullivan, is not going into court to try and bust people. He, this is really the kind of agency where you guys are out there raising and spending money, trying to get elected, and it's our goal to try and help you file this, these reports um, correctly. Um, so please use us, call us, and, and, and we'll help you out um, to, uh, to help you file these reports, and you know, hopefully you're successful. Um, so any uh, final questions at all about this? All right, well, when I break down, if you had any questions that you didn't want to ask in the group, please feel free to, to come on up and talk. Yes, there's a question. So it does advise you here to open up a bank account, and most, most <coughs> banks require an IRS EIN number. Yes. So do most, how do most individuals who are only going to maybe raise $500, $1,000, do you, how do you handle that? Uh, you, would, you would open up the bank account and make those deposits in there. So you know, I'm glad you asked the question. So funds should not, cannot be commingled. So if you are raising money, then yes, a bank account is required. Um, that's really between you and the bank, uh, but most banks now uh, ask for the EIN number. EIN numbers can be, um, you can get one from the IRS website. Yeah, and they're pretty easy to get. I have information in the office I can give you. You can go online and, and, and get them. I, it's my understanding it takes, you know, five, ten minutes maybe. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm not sure if this is the right form, but I figure I'll float it out there. Um, I'm looking at using PayPal as an option to collect credit card donations, but I have a personal PayPal account, uh, but you can, sorry, you can create either a personal or a business account. Would I create a business account and use the tax ID number that I already got for my committee or would uh, be the right way to go? For PayPal? Yeah. For PayPal, typically committees do have their own PayPal account, okay. so it's not commingled. Right. Uh, sometimes when when commingled PayPal accounts happen, um, you know, money is put into the personal account instead of the the committee account. So a separate PayPal account is is uh, suggested. Okay, and yep. create it like they they tier them as either business or should I create it as a business account for the committee or does it you'd, not matter? You'd want or? to. We we don't care on okay. that end but you'd want to contact them because when you raise money by credit card, uh, the committee is required to get the name and address at the time of the contribution as well as occupation and employer if it's 200 or more. And then on top of that, there's a requirement that, a, um, that there be a, uh, at, uh, uh, some affirmation that this is my money. Um, and so uh, there, you, sometimes they do have, you do have to do some work with these PayPal people to get that set up correctly. Okay. Yep. Uh, so I should contact them before I just mm -hmm. go forward. Thank you. One good example, um, if you are going to set up a PayPal account, uh, you can go to Charlie Baker's uh, campaign. Um, they have it set up there. Let me see here if I can find it real quick. There, Charlie Baker's website. Um, let me just say, put campaign in. I just looked at this recently, and they have a pretty good uh, setup for that. Charlie Baker for governor. So this is uh, the governor's website, and if I go to the donate button in the upper right-hand corner, it has the, they have all the information that is required. Uh, the amount that you're gonna give, name and address, um, and then by clicking contribute, I certify these things. The big one there is number five, where it says, you know, the contribution is made using my personal, my personal funds. Um, and so that's the kind of language that you'd want to have. So if you need an example, you can maybe go to that website and look at it. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Just, okay. just one other question. If a uh, candidate turns in their report and after review, say by the uh, town clerk, there was some discrepancies, whether it was the uh, not placing the correct expenditure or receipt in the right location, uh, does the candidate then have to file an, an amended form or just an amendment, or can they just correct the form that they currently have to, uh, to update it? <clears throat> Usually an amendment form is required. Um, there's a little leeway that, for that, but you know, the, the, the proper thing for me to say now okay. uh, in a public forum is that, uh, yeah, an amendment, um, an amendment form should be filed. And to find that, you would just go to uh, clerk support. I'm crossing my fingers right now, hoping it's there. Uh, and I don't have to go to another one. Let's see here. Uh, there it is. Amendment to a campaign finance report, CPF 102A. 
It's just a one page report. So it looks like the front page of a regular campaign finance report, but then it gives you this box here where you can explain what the situation was. So let's say it was a negative balance. It's because you know maybe they spent out of pocket and they forgot to put it in receipts. And so you can just write that in there. And the public, the whole point is that the public, when they see it, they understand what's going on. So yeah, an amended form is what we prefer. Yes. Um, you said we should fill out the forms, the, the 101 and then this eventually when we start to raise some money and before the end of the period. But it sounded like we give them to our local town hall. We don't submit them to you. That's right. You submit that it right? to your local so town hall. So we give them to them. Okay, That's right. great. But you also said that if we do give the 101 to you, then we can get set up to fill this out on the computer rather than do a hard copy. That's Can right. I understand that correctly? Yeah, yes, you would give the okay. original to your town clerk okay. and then you can send the other, you know, a copy of it or even you can just fill one out and, and don't even sign it. You can send it to me and I'll set, I'll set you up with that. Well, thank you very much for coming and good luck at your, on your campaigns. Thank you, Jason. Thank you.